Hey, Charles. Hey, Charles. Hey, brother. What's up? What's up? We're live, Charles. We are. We are. Oh, we are. <laughs> we are very live. Aloha Friday, everybody. Oh, God, it's hot. Again, it's hot. Oh, no. It is. <laughs> What? what? What's going on? What's going on? What's so funny? No, it is hot. That's why. Oh yeah, it's it's hot. It's hot. You try you try to escape that, brother. Is like, oh my goodness. It's like. But just, it's just hot, shut up. But I have the fan blowing on me here. I have my nice cup of coffee. That's why it's hot. It's uh, like it's like walking in a Mojave desert with uh. Hundred degrees and your coffee is about a couple of degrees hotter than that. No wonder. Oh, it's beautiful. It's so, <laughs> so delicious though. It's so delicious. And you know what kind of coffee I drink at home? Uh I guess. What that, uh, um I would say what kind of coffee you drink at home? It's gotta be one of those cake cake cups, those cake pods. You have one of those uh, machines? I have and a machine, but but that's not what I drink. Patrick, I bring my coffee so I can show them show the world what I drink. Is it this the Dunkin' Donuts? Food. The Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts? No, this is not an endorsement. This is not an endorsement. Oh, by the way, how you like my shirt? Kawhi Strong. Hey, right on. Right here, Charles. Yep. I, yep. Tastes choice. choice instant. It doesn't make 210 cups. That's a lie. It does make 210 it cups. Make it makes 210 cups. That's what it says right here. It doesn't make 210. But that's if you use one teaspoon. If you, well, if you use a small cup. I use four. Wow. I use four. four. So, yeah, I go through that thing four times as fast as the normal person that follow the instructions. Yeah, but you, right. drink yours, you drink yours black. Black? Completely black with a little bit of um, um, was that Truvia? Oh yeah, tru, tru, Truvia. Yeah. All oh, right on. Right on. Truvia. Truvia is the is the is an awesome uh, uh, sugar uh, substitute because it's it's not it's it's off of a it's off of a plant. It's like king. Yeah. yeah. It's natural. And it's 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 great stuff. So. It's but you, you saw how they produce that thing. That's what makes it. That's what makes it so expensive. <laughs> no, I didn't. Yeah, but uh, I know uh, it's okay. Charles, tell me how they make Truvia. No, no, no. It's it's just it's just real difficult when it comes from a plant because you know they gotta take so much, right? And they soak them, and they get a small little guy. They stick by the river bank and they squeeze on them all day just to make Truvia. You know, that's that's what I heard. Yep, I heard, I heard it with my own ears. Yep, mm, yep. I, I I heard that they get the guy, they get the old guy, and, and he chew him like Toscani. And, and then he spit him in a can, and then they they leave the thing out at night or during the day in the sun, and it crystallizes, and yep. then they put them in the little bags. That that's what I heard. Well, you know, it, it, uh, no worry. I, I pray for you. Good, good for you. You read it. <laughs> you know, I when I was in the Philippines. I forgot to send Senator Kochi the, the link, but I'm gonna do that right now. When I was in the Philippines, they ha you know they have that coffee that the little cat-like animal eats all the coffee beans and then make yeah. doodoo. Yeah. And then they go out and then they they clean them and they use that the coffee beans and it's amazing because that animal and I the, the name escapes me right now. Somebody will I know somebody will post it. The stomach can digest everything except the coffee beans. So all of the stuff around the bean, the husk or whatever you call it, it digests that, but it does not digest the bean. The bean comes out in a doodle. -doo. And <clears throat> um, so, yeah, it's that's the a, best, that, that, taste, the most expensive coffee in the world, but it's the best, not, best. That's a doodle, -doo, they call it the doodle -doo bean. Yeah, the doodle -doo bean is good. Doodle -doo bean, doodle -doo bean, doodle -doo bean. Doodle -doo bean. <laughs> um, what is that animal called? I can't remember what that animal is called, but uh, um, anyway, it's delicious though. Not the marmoset, eh? 
No, 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 no. It's uh, you guys. I gotta, I gotta, um, it's a civet. C i v e t. It's a civet. It's like a. It's almost like a cat, like a fox or some something like that. Anyway, it's the best best coffee um, I've ever had. It's very expensive because of the way they gotta go get them. But anyway, it's called a civet. It's look them up, guys. You don't believe me? It's amazing. It's great coffee though. It's really good coffee. See, Larry Ruda said it's really good coffee. Anyway, what if, what, what, if, what, if the, what if the thing what if the thing is the runs that day and, and, no, and the bean no come back out and they're also running? Well, what they do they they crystallize them in the sun again? No, 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 no. That that stuff just goes away. Only the bean they cover they recover and then they they have a whole amazing process for <laughs> for clean the bean. The people must be wondering. Yeah. People must be wondering. You know we. We turn into wash this crap about that. <laughs> yeah, it's cool though. Um, oh, Kirk Correa is on. Civet. That's the one. Civet. See, somebody got them. A lot of people got them now. Yeah, go check them out. You think I'm joking? It's amazing. It's very expensive. Um, yeah, makes you wonder how they ever came up with that. Well, what but happened then, was, and I can tell you how because I, I thought. Go ahead. <laughs> no, but you know, they also have the other animal in the Philippines that eat the noodles. That's how they get the because that down is for the coffee, the civet, the one they eat the noodles, they come out small the noodles. That's the pancit. That's the one they eat the noodles. <laughs> yeah, kopi kopi luwak. That's the one. Kopi luwak. You can get them on Amazon. It's for like five thousand dollars a pound. Oh, oh my goodness. So what happened was the civet was endangered. It was it was a it was a, actually it was a this guy put up a sanctuary up in the mountains of Philippines and they put all, they caught all these civets and they put them up there. And then, and then someone discovered that, wow, all in the doodle get the coffee beans. They would eat all the coffee beans, but the beans. So it was a natural way of husking the, the coffee bean. I know you think I'm joking, but it's true. Oh, no, no, no. I believe you. Just, yeah, no, it's, that's, it's, it's, that's why it's so expensive. That's yeah. why it's so expensive, yeah. Because you got to train the civet to mm -hmm. eat the coffee. <laughs> anyway, like I was saying, we get Senate President Ron Kochi on tonight. He's going to give us an update. Exciting news today, I guess, for some of us. <clears throat> um, you know, the governor lifted or uh, extended the quarantine to at least a month. Um, he, you know, it's really weird. I was just telling Charlie before we, before we came on that I watched the press conference today and it was remarkable because he repeated everything we've been saying for a few weeks now, everything that, to the T, to the T, which was the reasons why uh, he decided and the mayors decided to uh, extend the quarantine or extend the, yeah, extend the quarantine for trans-Pacific flights. But if you all watched it, it was exactly what we've all been saying for, for a while now. Uh, and he finally got it. He finally got it. So I will give the governor his credit that he did, I believe, did the right thing. You know, again, Charlie, we talk about the frustration for those that cannot go back to work, the visitor industry. Yep. But again, you know, folks, we, we beg the governor to please tighten up the, the airports, tighten up the quarantine, tighten up the, the testing. Once we get that down, once we get that to a point where we know we've reduced the risk as much as we can for the incoming visitors, then we can open up. That's all we've been saying. But the governor has hung on to this single pretest, which we know is going to be difficult because of the availability of testing. So the second best thing is to make sure that we got our quarantine process down. In other words, nobody gets away from quarantine. Nobody can can lie their way through the screening process at the airports. No one can lie their way and get a rental car or a Turo. They cannot get away from our quarantine. Once we can establish that, then I think the public will, will be um, comfortable and we can get our people back to work and we can get the businesses going again. But that's what we have to do. See, we all knew Uncle David comes on after hours to watch the show. Well, I tell you what, if, if you know he, the mayors all were on the same page, everyone was on the same page except for the governor, and and uh, I don't think he had a choice. And I know it's rough because he represents the visitor industry as well as the governor, 
but uh, you know, he made the right call today. And he said that it was the, the health and safety of our people was paramount. So he, he got it. He got it. I'm not, I'm, I'm, you got to give him his due because he did make that tough decision. Um, and, and that is what it is. So we're going to have Senator Kochi talk about that tonight, as well as the economy, as well as what the outlook, the budget outlook, and, and uh, whatever else Senator Kochi wants to. Uh, and I'm going to bring him in. Um, he's in the waiting room. Yeah. So it's always fun to have the Senate president on our show because. And there he is. There he is. He's, he's got the camera now completely changed to the blinds now. So you cannot see the table anymore. Even the table, I think his wife must have told him, aim the camera to the window, honey. And I think that's what he did. Can you hear us, Senator? Yes, I can. <laughs> Are you in your office? Well, the lead in I was going to give you <laughs> is that this is the most pressure packed show I've been on because <laughs> for the first time I'm doing the Mel and Charlie show live from Isenberg oh. and just off to my left I have some adult supervision oh. making sure <laughs> that this thing was set up right you know on my couch at Isenberg, I have the little blanket on the it, the blanket gotta go you gotta get it all set up <laughs> so you can't even see you know the part of the couch where the blanket sits on but <laughs> let's say that was all part of the process of getting ready for the Mel and Charlie show and uh, it's not gonna be a phone call but if you see a coachy fly swatter come out of nowhere and hit me on the head <laughs> You'll know Joy was not happy with my response. <laughs> Hi, Joy. How are you, Joy? I forgot that, that you're back home. Well, welcome back home, Senator. So welcome yes, home. back home. I should have recognized those blinds, but uh, so you're <laughs> you're nice and cool right now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, welcome back. I know it's been a uh, incredibly busy time for you and the legislature and, and, the, and the administration uh, since the last time you were on. So we'll just turn it over, my friend, and, and um, you can do what you do best. Give no, I, I think that, um, you know, with today's announcement, I can tell you we've been going through discussions for two months now about, you know, the potential of reopening. Certainly we had the uh, neighbor island restrictions lifted on June 16th, and we had been meeting before that. And, uh, you know, we were optimistic at the time we began that August 1st was going to be a good date. Our rate of infection was low. And um, across the country, things really were pretty quiet. You know, there were a couple of hot spots, but, um, you know, for the most part, it was quiet. And then what was interesting, because I'm on uh, the National Association of State Legislators, I'm the, uh, on the executive committee for the Senate President's Forum. I'm on the board of directors for the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee. I serve as the treasurer. So I have uh, quite, a, quite a bit of uh, contacts throughout the country. And during this uh, whole COVID-19 situation i've had various people reach out and tell me you know we have access to a variety of ppe and other uh you know items that we would need and i've been putting them in touch with either haima general hara or doh personnel and we were able to secure uh certain things and then one is in fact sherry sakamoto you know dean pigal's cousin she was the uh, uh, executive director for the Retail Merchants Association, uh, worked at, you know, lobbied at the Capitol for a while. She's in Los Angeles now. And two months ago, all of a sudden, I get all these emails because everybody had an oversubscription of supplies because the rate of infection had slowed down. And, and so I said, wow, thanks a lot. I'll, I'll see. But we really didn't need 
anything at the time. And obviously a lot has changed since then. And, um, you know, we've always said, well, August 1st was the target that we would continue to look at what was happening globally. And then what was our current situation locally? What, was it, what would be the impact on our health infrastructure? And, uh, you know, while he's been getting, I guess, uh, some negative tweets, I, I still quote Dr. Fauci all the time. We don't set the timetable, the disease sets the timetable. And with everything that's going on, clearly the decision today to wait for another 30 days at least is the prudent thing to do. Uh, you know, we still need to make sure that we could have the uh, app ready to do that tracking on uh, any potential quarantine individuals. And the second thing, more importantly, you know, the whole cornerstone was having the availability of pre-testing minimally. And pre-testing simply is not going to be available based on the rate of infection occurring on the mainland now. So that that probably wouldn't even be possible to, uh, to work those deals out. And so we need to uh, act in a way that ensures the health and safety of our residents. How, how does the, you know, Ron, how, how does, okay, based, based on what you just, you just said, we, we've always uh, found that because there won't be brief testing. We know that the second option is people land here, give them one test right away, right? On arrival. No, um, we but have tests, so that's not an option. So we, we so if you don't have a test, so so I guess the question is, we've had problems with the quarantine. What's going to be different with the quarantine this time to ensure that people coming in, possibly infected, asymptomatic or not, won't be roaming around to to spread it? I mean, that's that's been one of I guess that's the, been the paramount concern of everybody. How, how does the governor plan to handle that? Well, the governor has only one way to handle it, and that is to work in cooperation with the four counties. The law enforcement arm to do any of the arrests lie with the police departments. The law enforcement officials we have are sheriff's department that protect the Capitol, which is a small force uh, the judiciary. And, uh, you know, otherwise, there's no state police like in other jurisdictions. There's the sheriff's department with that limited task with a limited amount of officers. And then all of the uh, infractions or violations are enforced by the local police department. So nothing can be done without a partnership of the local mayors and the county police departments. If you want an effective enforcement uh, policy on uh, those who choose to come here and uh, you know should be abiding by the quarantine. The other uh, critical component is working with the planning department because we still have those vacation rentals. And the policy is a lot clear defined for guests who stay at hotels. And right now there was some relaxing of the vacation rental uh, situation and you know the legal ones are able to operate. Now, having said that, you know, we're fortunate to live on Kauai where Mayor Kawakami has taken the strongest measures at the airport after you leave to make sure that you don't violate the quarantine. Uh, Joy and I just returned from Oahu uh, at lunchtime today, you know, had to show our boarding pass, show our ID, get our green laminated card. When I flew back to Oahu last week, you just walk out of the airport, go get in your car and go. Nobody checked to say you're a neighbor island guy other than, you know, I, I filled out my forms before I could get through the security in Lehui. You know, they, they rang my phone so they'd know how to, how to track me down. So really, if you want it to be effective, it can only be effective 
with the partnership of law enforcement at the county level. Well, but but Ron, the you know the airports is is a state facility. The TSA, you know, I, I know we don't have any control over TSA, but to me, it, it would seem that the the state, and again, we, we're lucky, like you said, because we have that extra checkpoint outside of um, the airport here on Kauai, and that, and, and we have that extra green card going on uh, inside the Aloha card, but. Shouldn't the state be responsible for uh, at the airports for making sure that these people that's coming off of the planes are, if they're subject to quarantine, that they everything is in place prior to leaving the airport? I think that is what we're seeing. You know, they're using false addresses that cannot be verified by a telephone call. There, and we know this is happening because we, we hear about it. We hear about the police and the National Guard showing up at addresses of local people that have no clue um, that a visitor was, was uh, using their address as their place of uh, stay. So, and, and that is the biggest problem right now is how they're getting around the system because there's no way supposedly of checking and I, and I think that is the dilemma. Uh, that that's, that whole loophole has been exposed to visitors that are coming from the mainland and they're using it and they're using it successfully. And we know about yeah, the people. At this, uh, at this point, you know, in the CARES money, we appropriated $90 million for the airports to, uh, you know, work on getting what they need to be better as you know, um, the COVID-19 committee has been at this for three months now. You know, I've issued press releases in the past about, you know, suggesting ways that we could be better. And, uh, you know, the forum that they have and uh, trying to look at getting some of these track tracing apps and everything else, you know, they, we've had the same conversations you've had about what South Korea has been successfully using. and. Uh, you know, we're hope that, hopeful that we're close to getting uh, an app that we can use that would better track people coming in. We're trying to get a cleaner form so that we can focus on that. But really with the app, you know, it allows for the information to be distributed to law enforcement uh, to guest accommodations in real time. And then you don't have that person landing on Oahu and then making an Hawaiian Airlines connection to the neighbor island and saying, oh, no, no, I'm an inner island traveler and, you know, I'm, I'm good. And, uh, you know, right now, you know, it takes several days sometimes for that paper data to get transferred. There's been conversations of utilizing some of the money or uh, reallocation of some state employees to at least do data entry initially to beef up the quarantine situation at the airport and have a better data and tracking process. Well, just a suggestion, um, and we only, we're talking about, we get two issues, right? One, because now it's known and travel agents on the mainland, people that are in the know are basically telling people, just make two reservations. You make one reservation from your origin to Honolulu and then you make a completely separate second reservation, separate from the first, Honolulu to Lihui, Honolulu to Maui, wherever. So they come in, they get off, it's just, it's just a regular flight to Oahu. They go through, show the connecting flight, so they get to go on to the, Honolulu, uh, to the connecting flight. But when they get to Kauai and they're showing them the, tra uh, the tra uh, ticket, then it's showing a Honolulu to Lihui local flight and they get to go through, they get to go pick up a rental car and they get to go free and no one no one checks or is able to check. So that's the first problem because we're, now we're getting people that have totally avoided the quarantine. So in other words, to the enforcement people on Kauai, they're not even subject to quarantine. So that's the first problem. The second problem is those that are coming on the connecting flight, they cannot make it to the green card because they're subject to quarantine and they didn't get around that part. Uh, and then they, they use the false address, like I said. And I guess for me, it, a couple of, number one, they cannot rent a car while they're on quarantine. They cannot, they, they, that's just against the law. 
So why wouldn't we, uh, again, using some of those monies and put them on a shuttle to their destination or get them in a, uh, in a, in a government vehicle, in a, you know, somebody that's hired to take them to the location that they are going to be for 14 days. They don't, they, they, they don't need an Uber. They don't need a cab. They're going to get into a provided shuttle that's going to take them to their location because two things, right? Number one, it validates the address that they gave you. And number two, they get to where they got, where they need to go without making any unauthorized stops. So, well, that, I agree with you. I issued a press statement two months ago saying we should have that bus and hand them off at the Porta Cashier, and then the hotel would know, you know, who they are and uh, where they are. So, uh, you know, that's that's been expressed to them. Uh, you know, but the one thing I'd like to say is that. Um, any one violation of the quarantine is one too many because anybody who violates the quarantine is jeopardizing the health and safety of anyone they potentially come into contact with. So I don't want to uh, you know, indicate at any point that I'm not aware of that, that I'm not appreciative of that fact. But I cannot say in a clearer voice, the quarantine has been incredibly effective. And now we're focusing all of our energy on the portion of the people who come and then of those who are coming, the smaller portion who are now trying to get around the quarantine. When I hear people say the quarantine is not working, I need to strongly disagree. 30,000 people a day were coming into Hawaii. Now there are people who financially can't afford to come. There are business conventions that have been canceled and are not coming. And there are people that would be afraid for their health that may not travel. But the majority of the 28,000 people a day who are choosing not to come to Hawaii is because we have a 14-day quarantine in place. Now, do we have to improve on dealing with those that do? Absolutely. And I don't mean to diminish it, but it really, you know, still kind of surprises me to just keep hearing people flat out say, this quarantine just isn't working. 28,000 people are choosing not to come. Now, the problem we are facing and certainly why we need to work on beefing this up is all of the money that the airlines got, they are required to restore routes and put people back to work. And we're going to start seeing direct flights coming to all of the neighbor islands, which we haven't had to deal with because they were all coming through. Oahu, and that is going to present another problem. And so now we're looking at anywhere from five, 6,000 people a day, you know, maybe three times as many as we've been getting. And, and the other thing, I read that uh, arrival count every day, and it's not surprising that the Kauai count is so low because just as they keep telling you how you can break it, I think a lot of people are saying, you know, be very careful if you go to Kauai because these guys take the quarantine seriously. They send the people out and they have caught more people than anywhere else. You know, I've heard Mayor Kawakami sending the planning director to the airport with the laptop to show that people had illegal vacation rentals and were not eligible to get out of the airport. <laughs> at that time, but that's the commitment in working in partnership that we need from uh, the counties to partner with us. Uh, and again, the technology would give them real-time information so they could verify those false addresses. That, that is you a know. problem. And the other, the other thing too, real quick is, you know, those numbers, and I've asked, I've talked to Sue Kanoho and she's trying to make the change those numbers, the arrivals that come into Lihue is only the ones coming off of the direct flights. The, the ones that get off on Oahu and, and transfer or connect to Kauai, they're counted on the Honolulu numbers. So we don't even know how many visitors are here based on that, that report that we get every day. And, and that needs to be fixed, Ron. I mean, you know, I know Sue has been trying. 
And I don't know how much extra work that is to put the person's final destination if it's a connecting flight. But uh, as far and as I'll, I know, I'll send the I'll send the comments. But uh, certainly, the COVID committee had intended to meet today. The attorney general had indicated to Chair Dela Cruz that in the wrap up of the session and with the governor's potential announcement, which actually happened today that this was gonna be difficult. So they are meeting on Wednesday. And so, uh, you know, you know a few of the COVID-19 committee members rather well. So I'd send off an email and have some suggested questions that they ask on Wednesday. Thank you, I will do that. Charlie, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, Ron, as you know, again, we, we, had, we had many on the second time uh, this past Saturday. And her presentation was a little bit more comprehensive than the first time that she was on. And I think a lot of it stemmed from, you know, we're fortunate enough to, to get Jerome Kim to come by next Monday to talk to us about, you know, that process and being, I guess, a, a leader in, in that field, hopefully, that can uh, uh, speed things along. But one thing she did bring out, and I think it, it did stick with the viewers, and I, I see some of the comments, is that both the, the app that was developed by a, a Hawaii boy that lives in Korea, for the, the, that they're using for their tracking, as well as the test kits that was refused, but now was purchased. I mean, I guess a lot of it is the, the health department felt that there needed to be some kind of uh, vetting process to make sure that you know it, it, it did work. And, um, I mean, she, she quoting her, it's uh, their test kit is, has been approved by the U.S. government and running at a 99 percentile accuracy rate. So New York and California bought off on it and are purchasing it now. Would we be in a position, one, to purchase the test kits to supplement what we can't get now? And two, would we be able to use the app or is the app that's being thought to be used by the state now is something similar to what they have or maybe even better and that's why you folks going that route i don't know if it's uh similar or better they are engaged with it i know mayor kim said it's something they were developing and using on the big island and they're trying to work with them to get it done uh you know and i know the other thing you'd ask me about uh <clears throat> you know did doh turn down buying some of the test kits from South Korea. You know, when uh, Mayor Caldwell was gonna purchase some of those kits and do testing at the health centers uh, through a Chinese company that had done business with California or the city of Los Angeles, you know, there was a big thing about the health department, you know, not signing off on it. And, you know, so what criteria they're actually applying as to what's uh, you know, allowable or not, you know, we're not privy to those discussions in the health department, but Dr. Park is scheduled to appear before the COVID committee on Wednesday as well. So, you know, certainly that would be a fair question uh, to ask. And, you know, the real challenge is the United States chose to use a test that was developed by the CDC and not the World Health organization. So everybody else around the world is using a different test from the so-called approved test that we have. And, uh, you know, the first one from CDC didn't work, which got us behind the curve. And it's been problematic and supplies have been short. And so uh, I would hope that, you know, we'll find a way to uh, utilize some of the tests because of the shortages that are occurring. Yeah, because it seems it seems rather odd. I mean, I, I wouldn't see her, uh, mini, uh, Ms. Minnie Cole, making a statement knowing that it'll be viewed by many that not only California and New York, but other countries have now purchased purchased those test kits because of the uh, expedience of the results. Because that's that's the key right now: accuracy and the speed that you can get your results with. Especially there's when it's, it's a continual two-hour turnaround, and so when we hear something like that, I think 
And I understand that, you know, based on the program we have and the numbers have decreased. I mean, if we just had to use a comparison of 30,000 to about 1,500 a day as an example, yeah, we see the big decrease. But we always get into this position of the what ifs, right? What if by chance the thing ramp up? We've seen whether or not the state, the Department of Health, and I think the Lieutenant Governor has made it very clear that it is kind of like maybe upset with the contact tracing program. How fast can we ramp it up if the thing should just appear one time? I don't know, and I think a lot of the viewers just by looking at some of the comments tonight, I don't know if the confidence level is there to say that, yeah, they, that the state can jump in and react accordingly to, uh, instead of playing chase, chase master, being the proactive ahead of it. I mean, because that's, that's what it looks like. The so state think, can. Yeah, the uh, state can. And I've been incredibly frustrated for the last two months now. There are approximately 40 medical personnel that can do contact tracing at Tripler Hospital. And there isn't a large infection rate in the US military right now. And they would have uh, quite a bit of that personnel available to use, but the rules of engagement is <clears throat> any DOD, Army, Navy, Air Force, they need to be invited in by the local government. They can't just go in. And I don't know why we haven't invited them to help us yet. Mm -hmm. We have medical personnel who serve in the guard and they have been available from day one, but the guard personnel has not been asked to come in. Now, I'm excited that we're doing the program with the University of Hawaii nursing students that will eventually yield 300. But I also in doing the research found out that Chaminade University and Hawaii Pacific University have 50 to 100 nursing students as well. And both President Gotanda at HBU, President Babington at Chaminade said that they could make 50 to 100 of those students available to do contact tracing right away. So in a matter of a week or two, I could get you between two to 300 more besides the ones we have with these volunteer efforts of the DOD, the Hawaii National Guard, Chaminade University and Hawaii Pacific University nursing students and I did uh, again convey this to the governor this morning that they are there and uh, you know as our cases have been increasing I think it would give incredible comfort to our community to know that we reached out and we are utilizing all of our resources in our community and all of these professionals who want to help assist they are all engaged in the battle so that we can succeed so they are there we can get to two or three hundred more in the matter of one or two weeks now one last question ron uh then i'll turn it over to mel you know with regards to this kit would the would the covid committee and i it doesn't sound like they will be the decision makers of this but wouldn't it be worthwhile because you know really the state has nothing to lose at this point we're we're so desperately trying to keep the numbers as low as possible, given that the upswing of the rest of the states that we're faced with. But would it be something that the state would want to try, and that is get those kids from Korea? We have walking specimens that are known positive, and just test them and see if come back positive. And if the and, and if the kit doesn't work, it doesn't work. But at least we can put that to rest, because there there, there seems to be again there seems to be this anxiety of wanting to have the test kits available because the, the real question right now is the traveler returning mm -hmm. to Hawaii, whether it's resident or not. That seems to be the real question. And when they come in and, you know, if, if, if it's proven that this test kit works and, and, and they, they even talked about and correct me, Mel, if I'm wrong, you said those test kits would be at cost. So I don't think there's a, is, there's a profit to be made on this, but it would be something to help the state that we can say, okay, we address the concerns, and that is 
We have a test kit readily available to test all that come through the airport with a turnaround time of two hours or less. I think that'll be something, I mean, like I said, the state, we have nothing to lose at this point, but trying. Well, I, you know, it's worth looking at, especially if the supplies are in short demand. It's interesting when we had a limited national response, one of the few things we got were 15 of the Abbott uh, rapid test machines. And that was the one within 15 minutes. But they only gave you enough material so you could do 120 tests a week. So that was like each machine doing eight tests or a little, just over one test a day. And at that point, um, you know, it, it's not effective. I think what the, the success rate was like 87%. So they had an over 10% false, false negative. Right. So, um, you know, at this point, I don't see why they wouldn't have uh, run that through. Now, if they have, then they should also be able to come out and say, you know, well, it's really nice of them to say that, but these are the reasons why we can't. Well, I know many, many, many did mention that the test was approved by the FDA. So, I mean, at that test, I, I don't know what the, the was hoping to get um, Lieutenant Governor Green on tomorrow. Unfortunately, he won't be able to make it tomorrow. But, uh, you know, that's one question I wanted to ask him about, because that seems like an, you know, an opportunity that we should be at least exploring. Uh, because it would it would ease the the burden of testing anyway, um, knowing that we're going to lose a, quite a big big chunk of our capacity. Well, and then it doesn't uh, do us a lot of good because to us the twenties and the forties are high numbers when we had been in single digits for quite a quite a while. But you know, part of the material going elsewhere is they still don't look at us as being in the situation like a California, like Arizona, like Florida. And so where, you know, and where do you really need those materials? And then, you know, we'll give some to Hawaii, but, you know, for all, all that you're saying, you know, we don't see you as bad as these other areas. And that's part of the challenge we face too. But you know, with this virus, and we know we had Dr. Kimball on the on the show, and he, you know, he's he, he's in Utah, and he said, you know, two weeks, uh, two months prior, Utah was where Hawaii was at, and in two short months, man, I think just blew up, and they were chasing yeah. numbers like New York now. So that's, I think, the you know, it's it's I know a lot of people. A lot, I think we're all guilty of being complacent because our numbers were low for so for so long. And, um, and the thing about our contact tracing, we don't know. We know if someone got it from a gym. We know if someone got it from a store. I mean, uh, if somebody, yeah, somebody tested positive in those areas. But what we have never, what they haven't told us is where did it come from? Was it, was it right. brought in from a visitor? Was it brought in from a, uh, someone that had traveled and came back and brought it back? And a lot of the source infections are not known and that is what makes it makes it very difficult um i wanted to talk about the contact tra i don't know if you saw the show with mini cole but she sent me the powerpoint presentation that was supposedly uh presented to the state i'll send that to you tonight ron on email but it's it's very it's a very simple concept that and it's specifically designed for contact tracing so every establishment every restaurant every whatever public facility uh, would have a QR code that is at the entrance. And if you wanted to gain entry, you got to scan it with your phone <clears throat> and that would automatically keep track of your phone number. Um, and of course, the date and the time. If uh, infection, a positive, uh, a person test positive out of that establishment, that set of phone numbers gets sent over to the Department of Health so the Department of Health can actually do some effective contact tracing with a with a database of known patrons of that store, restaurant, bar, whatever the case may be. Very, very simple, and it was free. 
So I'll send that to you tonight, Ron. I, was, I will send it to the COVID committee as well tonight, um, and they can ask the questions on Wednesday. But uh, again, you know, it's a local boy that, that designed it. He's in South Korea. And, um, you know, we had a shot. We had an opportunity to utilize that here. And it's really voluntary. You know, you cannot force anybody to utilize the app, but the establishment would have the right to not allow you to come in if you didn't scan that QR code before you went in. Like an ID, if you're not, eight, you're not 18 or 21, you can't go in, same thing. And I know from what you and Charlie have been saying since the beginning on the show, or like myself, if somebody who was a positive was there, I, I would really wanna know that I could come into contact with somebody so that I could figure out what is the next best step for me to just try to take care of myself. I've only seen that happen once here. Last week where they talked about uh, on the news, if you were in this particular gym class or yoga class, you know, this gym, this hour, you know, the class of that, and they had like three different days. But that's the only time that I've seen it. And I know you and Charlie have talked about it uh, at length from the very beginning, why, you know, we don't need the name, we don't need whatever it is, but, you know, they don't know everybody they come into contact with. So why wouldn't you just let people know this per there was a person here at this time in this establishment, if you happen to be there in that window, then you may want to be careful. And that and would certainly- that's what the app does. You yeah. get this database. It, it is concise. It is specific. No names. Your your personal information doesn't even uh, it doesn't get retained. Just the phone number. That's all that gets sent over to the state. And then the contact. Right now, I got to give them my phone number if I want to get on that inner island flight. And I got to watch them call me and have my phone ring before exactly. they let me go. <laughs> exactly. Again, you know, you got all these civil rights people said, no, big brother, big brother. Well, you know what? Big brother no can help you when you get the COVID. <laughs> yeah. I'm serious, man. You, I mean, God, I'm watching the stories of people making the last phone calls. Yeah, I tore my heart out today. Yeah. This lady, I mean, calling her kids to tell her, tell them goodbye. And that, that's, come on, man. It's tough, you know, and I'm so over this people about the flu. You know, it's about the flu. It's like the flu. You know, this is not like the flu. And I'm not going to get into that debate. I don't like waste the senator's time with that. But it's just not for it. It's people dying. And my son, I talked to my son this morning. He calls me up. Dad, uh, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, you're not working today? He goes, nope. I'm on quarantine. I said, what? Yep. One of my students, he's a, he's a uh, master trainer for a gym. One of my students tested positive. And he, so I said, so when he called me, I said, did you get the test? He said, no, nope, I went to the beach today. You went to the beach. You're supposed to be on quarantine. <laughs> yeah, nobody was at the beach, dad. I said, did you take your test? He said, the, the testing is booked until he, he got to go tonight. He had to go tonight at seven o'clock to get his test. Wow. Yeah. So I ripped him a new Ocole for not <laughs> staying home. But my point is this, is he is his instructor in a gym. He says they practice social distancing. He does everything he needs to do. But again, one case, and I pray to God that his test comes out negative tomorrow. And, oh, um, boy. you know, but for them, it's membership driven. So, you know, the contact tracing is not as difficult, but you cannot say the same for a restaurant or a bar or a store, you know? Yeah. Well, let, let me ask you something, Ron. You know, right now, does does the state have any system in place to uh, contact anyone that uh, lands here or uh, anyone that should be close nearby a person who's infected? They, they don't have anything, right? They, they're depending on the contact tracer to go out and find the person. Uh, close other than, or other than the form. Yeah. To get, to get that first person. But then, yeah. yes, they need to engage the contact tracers. Because, you know, uh, a question had arisen on one of the feeds yesterday, and the person was kind of a little bit not clear about how it worked. And I, I kind of used the number system uh, because you know, we're talking about the new cluster that popped up at the, the nursing home in Pro City, correct? And I guess one of the employees 
who had gotten sick had been out of work for some time. So therefore, he tested positive, but it's unknown whether he got it from there or had to be someone else in the family that gave it. So if we tr if we tracked it from that point on, you can you can already establish a line who infected who down the line. But yet you're only talking about one strand of tracking. You're not talking about each person going sideways. Ultimately, what happens is the start is going to meet up with either with pre-existing infection somewhere on the island, or it's going to be brand new that was brought in. And that's the thing; it's never been determined that if it's brand new or not. It's just that there's this, there's this mystery that, ah, the strain is here. And I think that that brings up the whole bunch of problems in and of itself. But, you know, having talked about that, I think a lot of the questions I do see too is about, um, and I'm going to shift gears a little. And, um, and that's with our, our unemployment situation. Because people are still, uh, there, there are many out there that haven't, haven't uh, received the check yet. I, I know there are some glitches with the system. I know that there's some um, hacking that went on and there's some missing money in a tune about $15 million. That's a, that's a lot, of, lot of money to go missing. Um, what, what is the state doing at this point? How can they, uh, because if, you, if we're asking those businesses and their employees not to go maybe about another month, I think desperation is already knocking on the door. How can we uh, uh, address that with the unemployment insurance situation? Uh, we were talking to the governor about it this morning, and we're hoping that uh, unemployment insurance would be coming forward with uh, another statement. But the unfortunate circumstance, especially for the PUA filers, uh, you know, the independent contractors, that's where a lot of the fraud is occurring now, that it just takes time for those individual interviews to verify and make sure that the right people are being paid. Um, what I was sharing with the governor this morning is that I've been getting emails or calls to my office for assistance from people from Kauai, you know, and uh, I know Rep Tokioka, Rep uh, Morikawa and Nakamura have been getting calls from Kauai. Well, over this weekend, I started receiving emails from people all over the state who are frustrated and haven't gotten paid. We're trying to do our best to get through it. They're still at the convention center working on it. Uh, the only other thing that I can assure everybody is that uh, there is enough money to make sure that everyone will get paid every, uh, you know, dollar that they are owed when we can get it through the process. And we continue to work on it. If you're not getting, um, you know, your information through and there's still frustration, the best thing you can do is to... Uh, Email my office, which is S E N K O U C H I at capital, and it's spelled C A P I T O L dot Hawaii dot gov. So send Kochi at capital dot Hawaii dot gov. And we would need a phone number to contact somebody and the last four digits of the social to help identify if you have a case number you know, even better and uh, if it's been assigned. And we can try to assist in following up uh, and see what we can do. But because of all of the fraud or ongoing attempted fraud that is there, it is challenging to make sure that we are getting money to the right people. The other thing that we did do in our uh, deploying of the CARES fund is effective August 1st. We're going to be paying an additional $100 a month. I mean, $100 a week benefit. So of the $630 million that was sitting in the um, rainy day fund waiting for us to get back, $230 million was committed to that program. And we don't have enough money to do the 600 a week, like the federal government has been plussing everybody up. But we know that ends 
on July 31st and starting August 1st, there'll be an additional $100 a month to the unemployment that we're going to be doing from the state. And we've also committed $100 million that would allow you to get either 50% of your rent or $500, which if, whichever is less, for rental assistance. And so we are aware that um, you know making the rent and everything else is challenging. And so $330 million is committed to some additional unemployment benefit and some rental assistance for those who qualify. You, it was $100 a week, right? A week, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to, because uh, again, you know, a lot of people have been asking the question about <clears throat> about the state and, and, and I'm hoping that that's gonna be, uh, I'm assuming it's gonna be broadcast out uh, so everybody knows. You know, thank yeah, you for I'm, uh, doing some radio ads and newspaper ads as well <laughs> to talk about it. <laughs> no, but you know, I appreciate you you sharing that on, on our show. I mean, because that's where people come for the information. You know, it's so bizarre. <laughs> you come here and 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 we appreciate that. Um, that's a lot. I mean, the hundred dollars a week, that's four hundred bucks a month. The the five hundred dollars uh for rental assistance, I, you know, that's you guys I just appreciate that because it's 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 going to help so many people um but that was the difficulty long. when everybody said you know just spend the money because it's raining right now what are you guys doing you're so irresponsible but we knew the 600 a week was being paid for by the federal government that the federal government had deployed other programs we got monies to all the counties which are continuing to do feeding programs and we really wanted to take the assessment about how are we going to get through to December 31st, which is how long we could utilize the CARES money. Uh, one of the things that became very clear after we got out is when the 2020 seniors graduated from high school. They, there's no polite way to put it. They got, they got cheated with what happened with this disease. Nobody was prepared to do 100% distance teaching. And so we've got money to match with Hawaii Community Foundation so that these seniors can go get help, the help they need if they wanna to get to school, if they wanna to get to trade school. We wanna make sure that these 2020 seniors are not left behind. We've put money in and one of the things we'd like to do is seed companies that would be building manufacturing facilities that would produce PPE so that we're not at the mercy of foreign countries and bidding with other states, but we have local manufacturing here in Hawaii. Because I don't think COVID-19 or other kinds of viruses are going to be going away. I think that's an unfortunate part of our future. And so to the extent that we can start producing that here, it would be important. And then there is money for other biz small business in our uh, business and economic development and tourism department. Uh, you know, we have money for feeding programs, uh, you know, that we've set aside. We've set aside over $6 million for Title I schools are the areas of the hardest economic uh, impacts so that they can get additional devices and connectivity. And so we've gone about deploying the money, hopefully where it will have an impact. And then in talking to Senator Schatz, you know, he feels that there is a close to 75% chance that the U.S. Senate will take up the HEROES Act and the federal government will be passing another bill within the next 30 days or so that hopefully would uh, render further assistance. Uh, you know, we have put $100 million in to assist in the schools and businesses and medical facilities to get the necessary PPE to safely reopen. And so we're helping businesses, uh, you know, and, and health facilities to make that happen. Mm. You're cut off a little bit over there. I'm not sure why. Yeah. Um, you you um raise a good 
point about the new, possibly new industries, PPE, or, you know, one of the questions we had early on in the show was that if uh, there was any money available for uh, entrepreneurs that were looking at starting up um, a business that would be directly related to COVID-19, such as you talked about the PPE or even some uh, testing, um, you know, some, some component of COVID-19 is, is there funds available for? Uh, so DBED should be rolling out, uh, you know, the application within the next 30 days. But yes, so we've put money aside for that. Perfect. Now, regardless, regarding the, uh, the schools, I know you folks, well, everybody has been meeting intently with uh, Superintendent Kishimoto, correct? Uh, ro ramping up to opening of schools. And that's, I believe, what, August, August 1st? Uh, August 4th. 4th, okay. Well, um, at least students, August 4th. Teachers, I think, report the end of July. So, you know, like with restaurants, they went, I guess it was an uh, open, I, I want to say like an open understanding or an open statement that, you know, to be safe in restaurants, you go through a 50% capacity reduction. But it doesn't seem that way with school. You know, they, 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 they look at a, a distancing of uh, six feet. Yeah, but they're not talking about class reduction size based on a square footage per classroom. So I guess my, my question is, how effective or how safe, you know, because there's a lot of, like, say, for the hotels, as an example, there's a lot of questioning about how, how many times they have to clean just to be ahead of it, to be safe. Better safe than sorry. You've got that many students in a class. Have they ever discussed what their plans are as far as in a day, how many times the teachers got to clean? Is it after every class? or um, Because they're going to have students moving about. Uh, and and, and I'm, I'm not saying that the students are infected. But I think we run the risk that if one should be infected, it could be, you know, they keep on talking about the super spreader. And like Dr. Park said the gym had that super spreader. It only has to take one. So I guess to ensure the safety of the children, um, have anything been discussed with the legislature of what some of the intentions are by, by the DOE? No. No. Okay. We, uh, we had the superintendent and uh, when we had asked for, you know, questions like that, the response was that the plan was going to be coming out on July second and so they weren't able to answer uh we had a little exchange between the superintendent uh the chair of the board of ed catherine payne uh with you know chair luke chair de la cruz the speaker and myself and uh at least around that july 2nd uh period of time the doe on the website had one page up and Arizona School District, who uh, the superintendent had made a comparison with as far as something the legislature did, they had a 40 plus page document about how to reopen the schools. Uh, today, I saw on social media that HSTA had reached an agreement with the DOE at six feet and anything less than six feet needs to be negotiated which is very different from the statement last week where six feet is the general guideline, but we could go to three feet. So unless it's negotiated, you, you can't go uh, less than six feet, which means that uh, a lot of the schools are gonna have to be in modified uh, situations where you, know, you can only come into the classroom half the time and you'll be at distance half the time because you can't have the densities you were talking about. But that was why, you know, I was very concerned and worked with Bill Arakaki, Paul Zina, the other three state reps, uh, the 15 principals to get something going on Kauai a lot sooner because when they were doing the surveys for data, I felt it would be much too late. I only received an email late this afternoon about the results of the survey. And it still doesn't say, now how are we gonna accomplish the deficiencies? 
But fortunately for Kauai, we've got a plan that if your child needs to be a distance learner, we should be able to get them a hotspot if they have no connectivity and every student should have a device. And starting this week, I believe the training is starting for two or three teachers in each of the schools to become better distance teachers so they can go back and be the trainers in their schools. And then we will have another round of training to assist the teachers to be better at distance teaching. Uh, you know, we did say we wanted connectivity, one-to-one -one in devices for the students, but that was all centered around, you know, in-classroom face-to-face instruction, not distance instruction, which we now find ourselves needing to do. Okay. Well, you know, some people have asked, and so here it is. It's uh, sendkochi at capital.hawaii.gov. Some of you have been already texting uh, the senator's email address. It's S-E-N-K-O-U-C-H-I at capital, C-A-P-I-T-O-L dot Hawaii dot gov. Okay. And it's all lowercase. That C is a little big, but yeah, it's all lowercase. Charlie, you remind me of Lieutenant Governor Green holding up the white paper. Good communication. Oh, oh Christy no, Mark, well, you're going to put up your cell phone number. <laughs> well, the, the C was a little big because I used the wrong pen. You can see the difference. <laughs> you know, um, getting back to the, the classroom, one of, uh, one of, one of, he's on the call right now. He text, he messaged me earlier today. He went to help the wife set up the classroom and the best they could get in between desks from middle uh, center of the desk to the adjacent desk center of that desk was five feet cannot even get six feet um and that's going to be a problem and, and, and i understand the hsda <clears throat> came up with the negotiating uh negotiation and got them to agree i get i guess my question was why would the doe even suggest a three-foot separation um i mean I, I said this the other night on, on one of our shows was if it was three feet i just wouldn't send my kid it's going to be hard enough to keep them apart at six feet just because kids will be kids. Well, the, again, but the other part where, you know, all of this expense comes in for the younger students, because the bus seats are so big. So you could have three students on a, on a bench. And so you had six in a row and you can't do that with the bus either. You know, now to get the distancing in the buses and how many more bus runs do you have to make? And what's going to be the additional cost for that just to get students to school? You know, and, and, those, and part of the three feet, I think, I don't know this factually, so I'm just giving you my best guess, is they were looking for the younger students, you know, because it is critical. They have said, you know, between K through the second grade, that having that in, in school, in-person instruction was so critical for the younger students, but how do you accommodate them all? And at six feet, you couldn't. I think they were looking to have the kindergarten through second grade students in that kind of environment, but it, it's, you know, challenging as a parent knowing you know, your child is going to be in that kind of density. And then for the teacher, uh, you know, and, and that age, it's difficult for them to have the discipline to wear the mask. And, you know, Joy used to teach, so she'll always say, you know, at that age, they're always hanging on to your leg and, you know, hugging you and <laughs> unfortunately rubbing the nose if the nose is runny and, you know, sneezing and, you know, but they just love the teacher and, you know, that's all normal, you know, for them to show that affection and then care that way. But now in this new environment, the, those are all things that are incredibly uh, risky as far as individuals health. And then Charlie would be absolutely right. A school setting, uh, you have so many people that come into contact in different ways as far as super spreader and you know those kind of things it's all part of the challenge 
you know, um, a question was posed, Ron, um, the other night on one of a, another feed, and uh, I think uh, I, I talked to Mel earlier about this question, and that is with regards to um, being able to work with the DOH, because that seems to be, I mean, it's pretty obvious. There's there's something going on, but you know, I guess from people looking from the outside in towards you folks we just see what's happening that it's happening but uh and this is and maybe you can answer this or you can elect to pass it up but uh the, the lieutenant governor told me do it because he, he was frustrated as well when he told me to send a letter to to uh dr park and dr anderson which i did i sent a i sent a letter directly to dr anderson asking about his um uh, knowledge of passing up on some of the offers made by South Korea. So my question is, do you believe the governor has actually has a working relationship with the DOH or is it um, not as effective as it could be? What, what's your take on that? Well, actually my take is the opposite based on the decisions that he's made. Uh, you know, he is taking the advice of the Department of Health to heart. And their guidance has been the message that has carried at the end of the day. And so no matter what uh, considerations were given about the economic concerns that we face as we continue to be unable to open our number one industry, he is still you know, choosing the side of uh, the public health and safety. And that is based on the advice he's getting from the Department of Health. The other, the other thing I would say briefly back to the whole quarantine thing. And, you know, when I watch the show now and then they got the comments, all these guys care about the money, it's greed. And, you know, they're putting our health at risk because all they see is dollar signs. If in fact we were most concerned about driving economy and making money, we would reopen the airport and welcome tourists without the quarantine. As long as we have the mandatory 14 day quarantine in place, we will continue to argue about the portion who is breaking that quarantine, but that number is going to be less than 10,000 visitors a day. If we lift the quarantine, I believe we could see potentially in excess of 10,000 visitors a day coming to Hawaii. And as long as the quarantine is there, that's not going to happen. And that's still the most effective defense we have. Now it needs improvement and it needs a lot of work. I'm not saying that uh, it doesn't, but still the amount of people that choose not to come because of that quarantine is significant. And so I can only tell you again, even in the conversations we were having about August 1st, it never considered lifting the quarantine. And it was trying to find what measures could we put in place that we could let the public know that we think that we've mitigated the risk. And then we all know one thing's for certain, there isn't a single thing out there today that can give the public a 100% guarantee that that person we let come in isn't carrying the disease. And that's what makes this so incredibly hard. I think what would give the, um, oh, bef before that, General Hara still part of the game or what? I mean, he came on our show and after that, we never seen him again on TV. We never heard from him. I hope, I hope he didn't say anything inappropriate on our show and got yeah, did, did he Did he say anything that he shouldn't have said? Because, I mean, he was pretty he was pretty honest <laughs> and open. And then after that, yeah, I told Charlie, you saw General Hara on the... Nope. <laughs> we just gone. Never seen him again. Uh, well, we have uh, weekly... We were involved up until last week in a weekly meeting in the discussion about... Uh, the reopening plans for about two months and General Haro was in all of those meetings. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Green was in all of the meetings. The speaker and I were in 
all of the meetings, uh, you know, the navigator, Bruce Anderson was there. For the DOH, uh, the governor, there's some private sector people. And, uh, you know, so General Hara is still engaged, but we're in uh, different phases. And then I just spent uh, quite a bit of time with him Thursday afternoon. He came by my office at the Capitol. Drew Kanuhua was uh, at my office, as was Representative Tokioka. So he came with Colonel Logan, and we were engaged. Uh, Senator Kaheli, the previous week, had invited the COVID-19 committee out to Haima and Senate leadership. And so we got a briefing out in, out in Haima. So we, at least uh, myself personally, I, I believe the legislators have tremendous respect for General Hara and what he has done and the way he thinks and the way he goes about getting the business done. And uh, so I consider him a friend. I didn't realize he was sharing with me, he was the first National Guardsman to set foot on Kauai, so he, after Iniki. Yeah. <laughs> and he was yep. sharing that. And General Kauivi, when I was uh, in his office two Wednesdays ago, and of course his, uh, Sergeant Major is uh, James Jimenez, but he, he pulled out the, uh, the, the old photo album and I saw these uh, pictures of a black haired General Hara with a mustache when they were sleeping on uh, sleeping bags and the floor at, you know, like the Hanalei Courthouse. And they say now the guard gets put up in hotels and, you know, it's, it's a lot nicer than when they came for Iniki. Well, you yeah. know, he, we had a good show. We just never saw him after that. I think, oh boy, <laughs> no, Charlie, I, I, all Charlie's fault. He asked him the tough question. No, you know, I was, I was gonna <laughs> say, you know, right now, I guess, Ron, what you said is, he's with you in spirit, not physically, but he's with you in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can only imagine after You're he a was on interrogator, our... Charlie. <laughs> I can only imagine, Ron, after the show, somebody on the fifth floor went, "Come here, damn it." <laughs> What the hell you say there for? Like this, like this, like this, Charlie. Yeah, come I know what is the, I, I, I'll tell you what is the test. I'll tell you what is the test. Let's invite him back on the show and see if he can come back on the show. That's the real test. No, no and, and the real, you know what the real answer going to be? Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a really good show. It was, and he was really, he was really good in Fort Wright. But Ron, what I wanted to say was that, you know, people would be comfortable I think if we had, uh, and I know I, to somewhat I agree with you about the quarantine has dropped the number of daily passengers. Obviously it has, but as you can see, those numbers are rising pretty quickly. Yeah. So we're going to get back to where, not 30,000, but we're going to get to 10,000 real soon, sooner than we would like, even with the quarantine and, and, and the ability to track the quarantine breakers now is, is getting to be difficult just because of resources. So every day that goes by, we have a more difficult time tracking the people that have chosen to violate the quarantine. And I think that is where the, the people are, are concerned and, and, and really, really scared actually, because you see they're everywhere now. You can see the rental cars back on the road. And I have a hard time believing that every single one of them has been here for more than 14 days. I really, have a, I, I just simply don't believe that's true. So that's telling me that people are coming through the line, getting that green Aloha card and walking across the street, renting a rental car. So we well, know- it, Technology is the only thing that'll let us keep up with it. So, um, you know, whether it's uh, the one they're working on or falling back to the one that Hawaii boy developed in Korea, but that's technology is the only way that we can get real-time data to be able to effectively track this. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, that's what we have been saying for a while. It's not that we don't yeah. want the visitors to come. We want them to come. We want them to come into a system that is gonna protect us. Um, and quarantine is a big part of that. For those that choose to come and circumvent, you don't, like you said, one quarantine violator with the disease is one way too many. And that's, that's the concern. Question, Ron. You know, I, we had uh, one of our viewers, I, I, I see several of them who, who are law enforcement. 
I guess a question to be asked, the recent passing of uh, HB 285 regarding the uh, release of information for officers who have been disciplined and or discharged for um, wrongful conduct in their respective police departments. Can you tell us what what was the what was the impetus on, on even bringing this up? I mean, was it that many cases that it, it caused alarm for the legislative body to, to look at a bill such as that? Um, I guess though this has just been an ongoing uh, you know, battle that brews at the legislature every year. And, uh, you know, it had not moved uh, in the past for a variety of reasons. And I think with uh, everything else that went on nationally, that there were members that felt that, uh, you know, this was the year that something needed to be done. I, you know, it's not more complicated than that, and then it's interesting, uh, you know, how the circumstance changes everything because, uh, you know, in January with the two officers killed in the line of duty, there were several gun measures. And, you know, uh, clearly Hawaii is one of the strictest or has some of the strictest gun laws in the nation. And yet there were three bills that were all moving in response to that. And at the end of the day, only one actually got across the finish line. And, uh, you know, it seemed like we're so far removed from, you know, those tragic events in January and uh, dealing with what was, uh, you know, the most recent and present in, in the faith for everybody. And it's challenging. I mean, my dad was what a 26 year member of KPD, I understand what it's like to be on the family side for the officer. Well, you know, it, it was just, uh, again, you know, and, and you saw that we had uh, uh, Tenary and uh, and Malcolm on the show yeah. to this. Because one thing they brought up that was really interesting that's on the books that you folks didn't touch was that 92F that addresses the, uh, the release of the information anyway, right? with 92F, 92F. So will that both stay on the books or, or are you folks gonna repeal now on 92F? Well, we'd have to look when we go back next session if we'd repeal it. I mean, we're uh, done for now. What maybe uh, most people don't realize is that, um, you know, we recessed in March because it kept all of the bills in play that were introduced over the two year period. When we went back in May and took care of the budget bills, we recessed again because there were bills that we had wanted or hoped that we could consider. When we went back, we tried to look at what were some of the bills we could get agreement on. You know, those bills moved through, but when we adjourned last Friday, uh, sine die, that means, you know, we've come to the end. Now all the bills have uh, died for this year and then we need to begin a new next year. Now there's uh, maybe the third week of September, the Senate needs to go back into session to confirm 10 uh, judges. Most of them are district and family court, but we have one intermediate court of appeals. And then maybe when the election is over, we need to come back and confirmed 10 more judges, including a new Supreme Court, Supreme Court justice, because Justice Pollack retired uh, last week, I believe he attained the age of 70. And so the Senate will be back twice. If the US Senate can get uh, around to passing a HEROES Act with the House that they moved and the president signs it, then the House and Senate may have to come back jointly to appropriate money. Okay. But otherwise we're adjourned for this year other than the Senate coming back twice for judges. All right, Senator, we went 10 minutes beyond the time. We appreciate your time. Any closing comments for your constituents here on Kauai and all of those across the country that is watching you live? <laughs> 
Uh, you know, Mal, I see some of our old NACO buddies even are watching this, and it's a pretty late time for these guys in the Midwest. Uh, no, I, I just, again, appreciate the chance to to get on uh, to talk about some of the things we did with the CARES Act, some of the things with education. You know, you and I have talked on the phone about it, and, uh, you know, I, I am frankly troubled, you know, uh, the plan for the fourth quarter was the superintendent letting teachers individualize the instruction, which was a nice way of saying you're all on your own. Here's some general guidance. Now you go make it up. But that also meant that there wasn't a lot of uniformity as far as, you know, what our students were going to get. And now this was given uh, several options to the principals and then go make it up, you know, pick, pick what you want. So it sounds good that you're saying, pick what you think fits for you, but where is the guidance for help? Where is the guidance for safety? Where is that guidance about how the instruction was going to occur? And it almost seems like there's some abdication of responsibility when you pass it out in the way that it was dispersed. Uh, you know, I, I'm grateful that, uh, you know, we had all of those community partners step up and fund that program to help the Kauai district so that hopefully we will ensure that our children will get the best out of what this public school year has to offer. And we've got great teachers, uh, you know, that want to make it happen. And, you know, we need to ensure parents that, uh, you know, their children are going to be safe and whatever is happening, that they are learning everything they need to so that they can be competitive in, in the world. And, you know, I, I would just close simply by saying, you know, for this educational program, Joy and I donated $15,000 personally. And that's 20% of my pay as Senate president. But I want to be able to look at... Uh, any county or state employee and anybody else. And when they say, well, you know, what have you sacrificed? What did, what did you do? You know, at least I can tell them. You know, I put my money to try and help our children get the best education possible to allow them to be as competitive as they can in the global economy that they're gonna be asked to uh, compete in and you know, let's all work together to make sure that that happens, happens in a safe way. And, um, you know, the rest of the stuff, we're not going to be able to help, uh, you know, the working men and women or the unemployed men and women in this state without the help of the federal government. We are broke. We are borrowing $750 million dollars to close out the budget already. And even though Tom Yamachika writes these stories about, look out, the legislature is going to tax you. There is nobody for us to tax. There is no economic activity that could withstand that. And so we're all going to have to find creative ways to get, uh, you know, people back to work and some of that diversity we talk about so that, uh, you know, we can get some money spent in this economy to support each other, both the private sector and the government operations, or even more drastic pain is coming. I wish I had something more uplifting to say. I always appreciate your honesty. I mean, I, I, and I think we've heard it from every branch of government that it, you know, it's, it's tough now, it's gonna to get tougher. It's gonna to get tougher for the counties, it's gonna to get tougher for the state. And uh, you're right, we're just gonna have to get through this together. But I did wanna say thank you for your contributions. I know you do a lot for the community that goes unnoticed. Um, I appreciate, appreciate what you do uh, for the community. And not, you know, and money and, and just your time and, and your, you know, the connection that you've had. And even for me personally that uh, shared with me so I could, you know, get some help out to so some of our nonprofits. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Charles, any closing well, comments? Well, first, I'd like to say thank you so much to you, Senator, 
thank you for coming <laughs> on tonight for for you know just being transparent with the people letting them know where it's at and, you know for those of the viewers that are out there we are very for, uh, fortunate to have uh senator Pochi from Kauai become the uh, senate president because he has not only helped Kauai, he has helped all the islands and that's that's a fact he has help guide this legislature through some tough times. And uh, I appreciate that because it took a Kauai boy to do that, to, to really, to really guide guide the ship. And uh, the only thing I can ask, uh, Senator, in my closing statement is that we can just revisit the test kits and that app because again, the test kits is at cost, the apps is free. Uh, we're at a point right now, it's not gonna cost us anything just to try to use it and see how well it can be adapted because uh, like I said, you know, Miss Cole came on, she had no reason. I mean, a lot of people say, well, is there a motive? Yeah, the motive is because she she's from Hawaii and she wants to help us. And 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 they, they do it on a much larger scale there. You know, we don't have these uh, strike teams. I know the Lieutenant Governor talked about the strike teams. I mean, it would be nice if we had them. But I think we got to start putting everybody's mind at ease that we can track this virus, that we can do an efficient job and try to hold it down. But at the same token, put everybody's mind at ease that in order for this economy to move, we have to open up, but we have to make things sensible enough that we can track everyone so you can accomplish both because that's been the hardest question all this time. You open up tourism, yet you cannot do this job efficiently. You're going to have to do both because you have a lot of balls to juggle at this time. And so I, I think that's the only thing. And I, I'm sure, uh, like you suggested to Mel, that we do send that information over to the COVID committee and they can um, maybe talk about it. And hopefully by the next time we talk to you, Bruce Anderson answers my email. Unless, <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless he's right now talking to General Hara. Hey, is it a good <laughs> idea? Is it a good idea to go on this show or what? What do you think? <laughs> Um, am, am, um, I, am I going to mix or what? <laughs> Mel, Joy is holding up the white paper at me. So for the sake of uh, letting me get out of here safely, uh, yeah. I, she reminded me of two things. One, I did see a statistics where statistic where I think Kauai was just under 50% in responding to the census. Please, please, please. If you haven't done it, fill it out. If you uh, see your friends and neighbor, your family, let them know each one that we don't fill out is thousands of dollars that would come to the island of Kauai. And we're gonna need all the help we can get. So please fill out the census. And I know you've been running educational programs the other week, so I'm not gonna violate anything, but I just, encourage and remind everybody the ballots will be in the mail soon you know please exercise your franchise and vote for the candidates of your choice thank you thank you senate president uh and again thank you for uh sharing some time with us tonight joy thank you joy for allowing him to share he's been so subdued tonight it's no fun <laughs> when you're around joy next time go to the store Go Safeway or go someplace, fun factory or whatever. I shot the sheriff. <laughs> no, you know, I think we know it's not for you. We just, we, we just run out of time. There's a lot of questions. You guys got Senator Kochi's uh, email. You can always email Charlie or myself or message us. We'll make sure we get the, 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 your questions sent to the, the people that can't answer. Uh, it was a fun night. It went by really quick. We'll get you back on again, Senator. Uh, <laughs> Soon. I try to get and when you talk to your house candidates, I try to do a three uh, three um, uh, forum for our house candidates for Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. So, without mentioning names, I only got a response from one incumbent <laughs> and one candidate. So, hey, if nobody else responds, the candidate don't have all the time. So, they I, they were not aware of your uh, viewership. They may not be aware of our viewership, and if they, they, they decide not to take advantage, the advantage goes to the other person that's on the hey, show. Ron, Ron, just let them know if they want if they want some kind of uh, insight of this show, tell them to go ask General Hara. He'll tell them. He'll tell them. 
I, I have heard him talk about how much he enjoyed it uh, to others on Oahu. Good. <laughs> well, anyway, Ron, thanks again. Enjoy the rest Thank of your you. evening. Uh, stay safe. Give Joy a hug from all of us. And um, to the rest of you, we'll see you tomorrow night. Surprise guest tomorrow night because Lieutenant Josh, uh, Governor Josh Green cannot make it. So surprise guest. That means we know more one. So we got to go find him. <laughs> all right, you guys. You guys have a good night. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Love you guys. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.